Um, the, the dowry. Now, what, what, is a, what is a dowry? It's a payment to the father to marry his daughter. And, and this concept of a dowry actually is biblical. Um, let's go to um, Deuteronomy. So it's a payment to the father to marry his daughter. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you can apply things like this because if a dowry is meant to be paid to the father to marry um, his daughter, this tradition that I, I don't think Australians do, I don't know if Australians do, maybe you guys can tell me, because I think in Chinese culture, the bride's father pays for the wedding. But, you know, I think in American culture and Western culture, the uh, sorry, the, uh, oh, I'm getting mixed up. So I think in, in Asian culture, the father of the, the, the groom pays for the wedding, right? That, I think that's generally what our culture is. But in Western culture, it's the father of the bride. And I don't actually think that's biblical because it's actually the groom purchasing the bride from the father. So why should the father be giving away already his daughter and then have to pay for the wedding as well? And we don't see that in the Bible because in Matthew 22, when the king prepared a marriage, he prepared it for his son, remember? The king prepared a marriage for his son and then invited everybody. So this tradition that the father of the bride pays for the wedding, I think actually goes contrary to scripture. And it actually makes it not fair for the father of the bride because he's already losing a possession in um, giving his daughter away. But, you know, I think the concept of a dowry is biblical. We read here in uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 28. It says here, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver. And she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So we see here that the dowry was a set fee, so you couldn't just like overcharge, you know, to, to, marry, to marry your daughter. You couldn't just lay on any, any, any amount. It was a set amount. And I think it's interesting here that, th that there is an amount given, because I think what we can glean from that is that there is a, there is a value to purity. Because nowadays, people do not value purity. They think, well, what does it matter if I sleep with one person or I sleep with another person? And generally, after you lose your virginity, you, you, because you've already lost your purity, people that have lost their virginity tend to sleep with more people. Because what's, what's the difference? You've already, you've already done it once. The, the second time, the more you do it, the less um, serious it becomes. And it's the same with a couple that is dating, right? I mean, once you break that... That, uh, that purity and maybe you kiss or you do something that you shouldn't do, generally it's easier to keep on doing it because you, the, the first time has already lapsed and it, it's already, um, you've already lost that value in that purity. So anyways, it says here that if, if basically if you sleep with a girl that is not betrothed or not married, um, the law here actually forced you to marry that, marry that girl. Um, and I won't go into this all now, but it's just interesting that God has laws in place to limit fornication. You know, he has laws for adultery. He has laws against homosexuality. He has laws for uh, sleeping with a woman that's betrothed. But he also has laws for people that fornicate to stop its spread and say, hey, if you're going to fornicate with this girl, now you have to marry her. Or otherwise, you have to pay a fine. So if a guy kept on doing it, he wouldn't be able to afford it, right? Because who can keep affording 50 shekels of silver every time you sleep with somebody? And eventually, if, if the father does not deny you, then you'll have to marry her. And then if you do it again, now you're committing adultery. And if you're caught, you'll be put to death. But just compare this to uh, Exodus uh, 22. I'll show you here. If we compare this to Exodus 22, it says, And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So how much money was the money according to the dowry of virgins? 50 shekels. But we see here in Exodus 22 that the father had a choice to not give. So it wasn't that if you slept with his daughter, he had to give, you, give her to you in marriage. He could choose whether or not to. But it's interesting that even if he said, no, you're not going to marry my daughter, the man that slept with his daughter still had to pay the 50 shekels of silver because he took her purity. That was the, the price of the purity. 
So he is not, and we see there that it's still the father's choice whether or not to give his daughter in marriage. He has the authority over his daughter whether or not to permit that marriage to take place. So even if they were to elope and say, oh, now, now we slept together, now we have to marry. No, because it says if her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money. So he's going to be fined and he won't be able to marry his daughter. And he's probably told to pay that because if then the father wanted to marry his daughter off to somebody else, she's not pure anymore. So then probably the, the next person that she, the person that she does end up marrying uh, would not have to pay that 50 shekels of silver because she was not a virgin anymore. Um, now question, can, can the father lawfully demand a dowry? Well, according to the Bible, I think he could. You know, he could say, you know, if you want to marry my daughter, you have to, you have to pay up a dowry. But is it compulsory? You know, does, does a father have to receive a dowry? Uh, well, no, because obviously if, it, if, it, if the daughter belongs to him, he can decide whether or not he wants to receive a dowry or whether he wants to give her as a gift to the man that wants to marry him. So that's, I think that's entirely up to him. Now, the question did come up last week is, you know, well, well does that mean that? Because I think if you read these verses about the dowry, then the question then arises is, well, is, is, is a daughter property of her father? Now, in our day and age, it's, it's a very controversial topic because, you know, all the women's rights and the f feminist movement and the f feminist um, agenda. But I think if we were to be consistent with what the Bible says, you know, that, that a, a daughter is property of her father because you've got to ask the question then, well, if she isn't, why is the father receiving a payment for it? Do you know what I mean? Like if, if the daughter does not belong to the father, then why, why does the father receive 50 shekels of silver in order for you to marry his daughter if, she's not, if she doesn't belong to him in some sense? Um, but see, this is the reason why I take this position. And I, and I know it's controversial in our day and age, but you know, I don't think it should be in God's house. I think we just need to think about this and reason, you know, well, if God says that a daughter is property of her father's, let's just understand this and just understand why um, that's the case. But um, let me show you this verse in Exodus 21 because it's this verse that really makes me um, sort of uh, take, get in, uh, you know, back, sort of get backed into a corner and think, well, I have to deal with this verse one way or another, otherwise I don't believe the Bible. I don't know if you've ever seen this verse. People bring this up when they try and discredit the Bible. But it says here in Exodus 21, And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. Now, if you read this verse, I mean, this is, you, you can't deny the fact that a, ma a man is selling his daughter. Right, so just let that sink in for a bit. But it says here, and if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the, as the men servants do. So what is this verse talking about? Because people will say, wow, the Bible condones slavery. The Bible says that, you know, what, 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 what good price should a daughter fetch and things like that. But that's what a dowry is. You know, if you think about it, I mean, it, it, I think the words that I just used just sound bad in today's context because when we think of selling something, we think of dehumanizing something, not valuing it, you know, you know that property is not treated well. Um, but I don't think the Bible uh, talks about it in that sense. And if you're wondering what it means to sell your daughter, I mean, a dowry can, can really be one way that you've sold your daughter right? Because he, he's bought his daughter to be his wife. And I think this is what this is actually talking about when it says if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, because I think a, a, a girl could be betrothed to somebody, right? And the dowry paid. And, you know, as long as she's betrothed to that, to that, um, to that man, she's her servant, right? Just like a wife is, you know, a wife is my servant too. Um, but that's not talking about how you treat them. Now, look, if you read on further, it says, if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. And now look at the context. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he hath betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. And if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Now, is it right for him to take another wife? No, but it's just saying there that if he does, he's dealt treacherously against her, right? And he's saying that he still has an obligation to look after her, to provide for her. 
And it says here, and if he do not these three unto her, then shall she go out free without money. So I think we have a preconceived idea when we first read verse 7 and we think, oh, you know, this is, we think of the cotton pickers, right, and the slavery and how they were treated. But that's not what's actually going on here. It's just that a dowry has been paid. The, the transfer of ownership has happened from one man to another. But the Bible's saying here that if he doesn't do these three things, if he doesn't actually marry her himself, either betroth her to his son, or, you know, if he marries another, he has to keep looking after her, then she's not obligated to stay with him. And it says here in verse... Um, Eight, to sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. So what I understand from that is, is when he purchased this wife and he paid this dowry, the, the intent was to marry her, right? And to look after her or to betroth her to his son or to continue to look after her, but he didn't do that. So, all, all that to say this, you know, so we have this principle here of a dowry. We have this selling your daughter to be a maidservant. So I think if we, have to, if we want to be consistent, we can just accept the fact, hey, you know, women are property of their husband. A daughter is property of their father. Hey, children are my property. My sons, my sons are my property until, um, you know, my sons are a bit different because when they grow up, they can leave father and mother and cleave unto, cleave unto their wife. So yes, God does treat women and men differently and there isn't a problem with that. The problem is not whether or not you own somebody. You know, because this is what people think. It's like, oh, you can't own somebody. It dehumanizes them. No, that's not the issue. The issue is not whether you own somebody. The issue is how you treat them. Because even in the Old Testament, when you were to buy a Hebrew servant, you had to treat them a certain way. You just couldn't treat them any which way you, any which way you wanted and you had to provide for them as well. So it's a totally different idea of what we have when we think of uh, owning a person. This is owning a person and caring for them. And sometimes it was a, an advantage to the person being bought, right? Because they, they couldn't afford to take care of themselves. Their owner would take care of them. And another point is, you know, well then, if, if my daughter and my wife do not belong to me, why am I responsible for them? And why does God hold me accountable to something that doesn't belong to me. That's a bit unfair, isn't it? Like my daughter doesn't belong to me, my wife doesn't belong to me, they can do whatever they want, they're not under my authority, and yet God holds me accountable for my family. So there are a couple of reasons why I think this is consistent, and I think if we as Christians understand it, then we can defend the Bible. Because if you stand on the Bible and you say, hey, the Bible's the word of God, the Bible has hard passages like this, which with a preconceived idea are hard to understand. And if we resist them, just like the whole Cain and Abel thing I was talking about before, if we resist it instead of understanding how it fits with the whole Bible, then these inconsistencies won't be pointed out to us and we can stand on what we claim to believe. 